Welcome to today's uh, ASIN's virtual public lecture, the PageRank algorithm. Before proceeding, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I live and currently work, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and to indigenous communities who may be online today. Uh, please note that this lecture is recorded um, and will be made available on the ASIN's website, uh, www acems.org.au and for those of you unfamiliar with ASEMS, ASEMS is the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers. My name is Tim Garoni, I'm a Chief Investigator with ASEMS and the Deputy Director responsible for outreach. Now today's lecture is something of a special occasion, it will be the last ever ASEMS public lecture. The very first ASEMS public lecture was given by our Director, Professor Peter Taylor, and I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Peter back to give today's lecture. Peter received a BSc and a PhD in Applied Maths from the University of Adelaide in 1980 and 87 respectively. In between, he spent time working for the Australian Public Service in Canberra. After periods at the University of, Universities of Western Australia and Adelaide, Peter moved to the University of Melbourne at the beginning of 2002, where he's remained ever since. In January 2003, he took up a position as the inaugural Professor of Operations Research. He was the head of the Department of Mathematics and Statistics from 2005 until 2010. Peter's research interests lie in the fields of stochastic modeling and applied probability, with particular emphasis on applications in telecommunications, biological modeling, economics, healthcare, and disaster management. He's editor-in-chief of both the Journal of Applied Probability and Advances in Applied Probability. From 2006 to 2008, Peter was chair of ANZIAM, and from 2010 to 2012, he was the president of the Australian Math Society. In 2013, he was awarded a laureate fellowship by the Australian Research Council, and he's currently director of ASIMS. At the conclusion of Peter's presentation, we'll be taking questions. Please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen to post questions. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Peter to speak to us about the PageRank algorithm. So, thanks very much, Tim. Thanks for that introduction. Can everybody hear me? Tim, can you hear me? Maybe if you say yes, I'll yep, all good. assume everyone can. So, like Tim, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm sitting, which is also the um, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and to all Indigenous people who might be listening today. So, I'm actually going to talk about the PageRank algorithm, uh, which is not really something that I've done any work on myself. I've done a little bit, which I'll mention near the end. But I think it's a really, really interesting case study in the use of mathematics uh, for utility of society and how uh, really, what is actually mathematically quite a simple idea can go an enormous distance. Okay, so I'll move forward. Did everyone see their, my slide change? Just check that that's working. Yep, okay. Okay, so what I'm actually going to do is essentially discuss a paper. And that paper's reference there, it's uh, reference one, the page rank citation ranking, bringing order to the web. And this I don't think it's ever actually been published in a journal or refereed conference proceedings. If someone knows better, please correct me. But you can find it in a lot of places in the web and I've just written, just Google it. Um, I hope you realize that that might be ironic given what I'm gonna be talking about. Um, the paper was written by four people, Lawrence Page, Sergey Brin, Rajiv Motwani and Terry Winograd. And you can find it in 1998 and 1999. So I'm guessing that's around about then, obviously a bit before then they wrote, wrote it, and obviously there might've been development going a little bit before that in the late 90s. Okay, so what's important about PageRank? Well, if you don't know it, it's, well, let's have, um, well, if you don't know um, what it is, it's widely thought to have given Google the Google search engine, the advantage that made them the number one search engine in the world. And obviously they've moved on from the simple idea of page rank now, but it's thought to be the thing that gave them the start. So in, in some sense, it's, um, it's a very important uh, algorithm that enabled, that gave a competitive advantage to Google right at the very beginning of um, the development of search engines. 
the two people who developed um, it, Larry Page on the left, Sergey Brin, were PhD students at Stanford. I'm not sure of the corporate structure of Google at the moment, but at some stage they were very, very big in the ownership of Google and they've uh, certainly done very well out of it. They're very young here, I think right now, they're probably in their 40s and 50s, I haven't worked it out precisely. Certainly two of the very, very, very big names in the development of um, computer science um, in the early part of the 21st century. But that's two people. And if you go back to here, there are four people whose name is on that paper and what happened to the other two. So as I mentioned, Page and Bring were PhD students. I don't believe either of them ever finished their PhD, which from the point of view of the University of Melbourne wouldn't look good in the completion statistics if they were here. But I suspect that Stanford doesn't really care about that because what they've brought to Stanford is way, way more than two PhD completions. So what about the other two? Well, I haven't done any really in-depth things, but I have had a bit of a look around the web. Rajiv Motwani um, seems to have been a very distinguished professor of computer science at Stanford who did win the Girdle Prize in 2001. And he helped to fund a number of startups that emerged from Stanford in the second part, in the rest of that decade. But unfortunately he died in an accident, drowning in his own backyard pool in 2009. So it appears that he was a very, very talented person who the world uh, sorely misses. Terry Winograd, on the other hand, who's getting on a bit, he's now 75, um, is still around and known for his work on artificial intelligence and natural language processing. And he was one of Larry Page's PhD advisors. And by the way, I, I, I believe um, that the algorithm is called PageRank because Larry Page is one of the authors. I've always previously thought that it was called PageRank because it ranks web pages, but I believe it's actually named after him. And again, I'm stand to be corrected if anyone knows better. So I'm going to quote, whenever I write in purple, it's a quote from the, from the paper, which I mentioned, uh, reference one. So the first thing is it's about a search engine. So when you a query, when you enter a, a query into the search engine for a particular subject, then the first thing the search engine's got to do is find all the relevant web pages. But what Google does is something, or what Google did when it first started, was something a little bit more than that. So this is what it, um, uh, the authors of, of Reference One say about it. To answer a query, the search engine finds all the web pages whose titles contain all of the query words. Then it sorts the results by page rank. This search engine is very simple and cheap to implement. So it does two things. First, it finds relevant pages that match the query words, but then it ranks them and it ranks them according to this algorithm called PageRank. So that's the first thing. Second quote, and I really like this one. To test the utility of PageRank for search, we built a web search engine called Google. So it wasn't like they, um, they assumed that everyone knew what Google was. They had to introduce it. And this was in 1998, 1999. The world hadn't heard of Google. And now we use Google as a verb. We Google something. But that is a relatively new thing. Um, you know, it's definitely a 21st century phenomenon. Before that, there were plenty of other search engines, Yahoo, Lycos, a bunch of other things. Again, I had a bit of a look on, on the web this morning and you can look it up and you can Google search engines that aren't Google and uh, find out what was going on. And some of us are old enough to remember what it was like before Google. And um, it was quite interesting. We didn't really have the capability for searching that we've got now. Okay. There's some other interesting quotes and one is about motivation. So they wrote that it's obvious to apply standard citation analysis techniques to the web's hypertextual citation structure. One can simply think of every link as being like an academic citation. So what they really mean is that if you've got a web page that has a hyperlink to another web page, that's a reference by the first web page to the second web page. And that's really like an academic paper having a citation to another academic paper. So citing someone in an in a academic paper context is like having a hyperlink in a, um, 
in a web page context. And they also wrote that although there's already a large literature on academic citation analysis, there are a number of significant differences between web pages and ac academic publications. And really, if you start thinking about it, what you really, the structure you really need to be able to do this sort of thing is a directed graph. It's a graph that has some type of nodes and a way that they can refer to other nodes. So that's what academic papers, you can think of an academic paper as a node and a citation as a, as a link to another node in a directed sense, because one points to the other. And the same way you can think of a node as a web page and a hyperlink from one to the other is a link that, a, dire, a directed link that points from one to the other. So really this sort of thing can be done on any directed network, social network or otherwise. And I might just comment here, when I first heard about PageRank as a, a way of ranking web pages, I thought, oh, maybe you could do this to, um, to academic papers. Um, and it was only when I read this paper much, much, much later that I realized that it was actually academic citations that provided the, the authors of PageRank their motivation. So in some sense, I was reverse engineering the motivation they had in the first place. Okay. So what, what was the idea? Well, the basic idea was that web pages that have a large number of other web pages pointing to them should be highly ranked. Okay, it's sort of like saying it's it's the equivalent of um, of the academic thing that if you've got your paper gets a lot of citations, then you should be highly ranked. And that's really what um, what the idea was behind PageRank. But even more than that, if you have a large number of highly ranked web pages pointing to you then you should be even more highly ranked. So it's not only the number of citations, if you like, that you get, but it's whether you get them from other highly ranked sources. So web pages that have a large number of highly ranked web pages pointing to them should be highly ranked. And when you see that second point, you realize, well, that's sort of crying to be written down as a mathematical equation. You know, we've got some ranking and that, the ranking of the web pages that point towards you go to uh, towards your ranking. And of course, that becomes a bit self referential and you have to think about how you might write that down. So what the authors of, of, of the paper wrote that they what they did was they used this second principle to write down an equation that should be satisfied by a pages rank. And if it was completely easy to do that, this would be a very short talk. And um, but there are a few interesting things that come out of it and you it turns out that they had to develop their thinking a little bit beyond that in order to get something which worked. So that's really what the rest of this um, talk is going to be about, is how that thinking developed. But the basic idea is that if you've got a large number of highly ranked web pages pointing to you, then you should be highly ranked. So how does that work? Well, this again is a quote, and there's a little bit of mathematical notation here. And what I will do is just talk about what they wrote, and then I'll try and explain it. So this is what they actually wrote. Let you be a web page, and F of you be the set of pages that you points to. So if you like, they're the forward, F means forward from you. And B of you be the set of pages that point to you. So um, they're the set of pages, uh, if you like, B of you is backward. They're the ones that come into you. So in particular, if you want you to be a highly ranked web page, you want B of you to be a big set, a lot of other pages pointing to you, and you want that set to have highly ranked web pages in it. In order to, to think about it, we actually need to define something else called N of U, which is the number of forward links going out of a web page U. So that, that piece of notation I've got there just means uh, the absolute number of forward links. And they say, and let C be a factor used for normalization. Uh, brackets. This is quoting from them. So the total rank of all web pages is constant. One of the things I'll say about this paper is they had some reasonable mathematical intuition, but I don't think they had the mathematical training to be able to express their ideas very well. Um, and that is an interesting um, observation, I think. So whether behind the scenes they actually wrote things differently, I suspect they did, because if they wrote it like they wrote it in the paper, um, they wouldn't have got the thing to work. Um, but the paper actually is not very well expressed. 
but you can see that they've got really good mathematical intuition behind their ideas. So th what they said is we begin by defining a simple ranking R, which is a slightly simplified version of page rank. So R is actually a function from the set of web pages to some real numbers, to real numbers. So it really is R of U is the ranking of web, web page U. So the ranking R is actually, a, a, if you like, a vector function, if you think of, of every, uh, with a component corresponding to every web page. So if you want to embody the principle um, that we had before, that they had in that second dot point, R of U is the ranking of page U. R of V, so this, this here, is we sum over all the web pages V in B of U. That's the web pages that point towards you. And their ranking should count. So we put their ranking in the equation. But in, other, in another sense, you can't have some highly ranked web page that, that actually has many, many, many outgoing links. In some sense, you can think of web page V as having a certain uh, allocation of, of voting power that corresponds to its own ranking. But that has to be um, modulated by how many outgoing links they are. So in some sense, what a web page V can do is allocate RV over NV. That is, um, it's got a ranking RV, but it has to be shared out between all its outgoing links and their NV of them. So in some sense, RV over NV is the vote from web page V to web page U if one of the links out of V happens to be uh, to you. So this is the sum over all the pages that point to page U of their, if you like, their votes, which is their total ranking divided by the number of outgoing links they have. And they put this C in because they realized they needed a constant, but I don't think they quite understood why they wanted a constant. There's something in the q and I'll just stop and have a look at it. Uh, Min Nok Trang said, what does it mean by a web page points to? It means that a web page has a hyperlink to another web page. Okay, so um, you can go on a web page, you see something, you click and it takes you a, a second web page, that points to is a hyperlink out of a web page. Okay. So, now let's move forward. So this is really what happens here. There's the web page U. Here's the set of web pages B of U that points to it. They all got hyperlinks going this way. You're in U, you've got some hyperlinks going out this way. There's N of U arrows going out. And if you think of some page here, that's some page V here, that's got N of V arrows going out. And so one of them goes to U and that one in some sense takes the ranking of this web page V and gives one over N of V of that vote towards you. Some more questions, I'll just look at them. If a web page links multiple times to count my own Mark Holmes, he would ask a difficult question. I don't know the, the answer to that precisely, Mark, because in fact, no one knows exactly what, um, what Google do, but let's for the purposes of this talk say, no, it only counts once if you've got one hyperlink out. Um, Okay, so that's the sort of scenario. You've got a web page view. Each of them, you, you, you say, you imagine each of them has some ranking and you write down an equation for that ranking, which essentially captures the idea that the ranking of all the pages that point to you, point to the web page view, um, get to split their ranking up between all their outgoing links and uh, one, in, one over NV of that link goes to page U. Okay. So, okay. Any mathematically trained person who sees an equation like this should be thinking, we can write that as a matrix. Okay. It's got a sum over some V. So if we put the right entries somewhere, we can turn this into a matrix equation. So that's what they did. Stated another way. Let A be a square matrix with the rows and column corresponding to web pages. And I'll just point out, there's a lot of web pages. So A is a big, big, big matrix. 
right now it's probably got billions of entries, billions of rows, billions of columns, which makes it hard to do things like work out its determinant and, and write down its characteristic equation and a few other things that we might want to do as we move on. We let A, U, V, so the entries of the matrix, so the U, V entry, so each, um, each row corresponds to a web page and each column corresponds to a web page. So the U, V entry is the entry in row U and column V that um, basically is one over N U. So what it does is for each row, you look at um, all the other web pages V that have a, an edge from U to V, and you put one over N U there. And if there's no edge, you make a u v equal to zero. And they wrote, if we treat r as a vector over web pages, then we have r equals c times a times r. So r is an eigenvector of a with eigenvalue c. In fact, we want the dominant eigenvector of a. So eigenvectors, eigenvalues are things that we teach in our, in our first year linear algebra course, and I'm actually going to mention those a little bit in a minute. So this is sort of getting to, you know, first year undergraduate mathematics. So it's a little bit beyond high school, but it's not super advanced. And they've made this, um, this observation. When I read this paper, my first observation is there's a problem with this statement. And I just want to ask if anyone else can see it. And it's a very, very basic problem with the statement. Someone's put in four. Is it, no, Mark, it's more basic than that. Uh, it's not one over C, I don't think anyway. Uh, oh, hang on, maybe it is. Let me just have a look. Yes, the eigenvalue is one over C, that's true. Um, but it's a more basic problem than that. Hang on, I've got to go back. It's to do with matrix multiplication. They've actually uh, thinking of R as a column vector multiplied by A on the right. And in fact, that's not what their equation says. Their equation actually should have um, R equals C times R times A. It should be a left multiplication by a row, not marked right multiplication by a column. So in some sense, their A is not this. They're thinking their A is having a transpose. Um, anyway, they obviously, as I say, in the background, they must have done this right, but when they wrote their paper, they didn't actually write it out properly. So what do, what do we mean about, um, what is this stuff about eigenvectors and eigenvalues? So this is roughly what we teach in first year linear algebra. So I'm going to consider the context of having a square matrix A with real entries, but just remember the web page matrix is huge. So uh, we've got a possibly, possibly complex, it's allowed to be complex, even though the matrix has real entries, the vector, the thing called the eigenvector and the thing called the eigenvalue are allowed to be complex. Um, which is such that AV equals lambda times V for some complex number lambda is known as an eigenvector of A. So it's essentially um, a vector such that is fixed by multiplying by the matrix A in a such a way is that it might be rescaled, but the vector itself doesn't change. And the number lambda is known as the corresponding eigenvalue. And as I point out, the authors of one got the equation wrong. It should be um, R because CRA. And what for me that means is that R is what's known as a left eigenvector of A with eigenvalue C. What we don't teach in first year linear algebra, algebra courses is that for any given eigenvalue, there is both a left and a right eigenvector. Um, I personally think we should teach that in elementary linear algebra courses, but we usually don't. Um, and what we really want here is a left eigenvector of A uh, with eigenvalue one over C, as Mark points out, because the one over C should be over here if you compare it with this. So that's fine. That's about eigenvectors, but they also said something else. In fact, we want the dominant eigenvector of A. So what are they talking about when they mean dominant eigenvector? Well, this takes me back to um, something which is a, a big favorite of mine um, called the perrin frobenius theorem. And my favorite reference on this is uh, Eugene Sunita, who is a 
a, a professor at the University of Sydney. He wrote a reference called Non-Negative Matrices and Markov Chains, and uh, you see a copy of it here. And what you're supposed to notice about this picture is how dog-eared the book is. Because this is probably the book that I've most often opened in my career. And I certainly, when I was doing my own PhD, uh, worked a lot on this. So um, it's a really, really good book. Um, starts out on page one with the Perrin Fabinius theorem. Um, there's lots of other really good stuff in it. It goes on, of course. But it's really a really good book that, uh, that talks about the relationship between matrices. And there can be um, later on um, infinite matrices and the Markov chains. And we're going to be looking at um, uh, the page rank algorithm in the context of Markov chains a little bit later. So here is the statement of the Perrin Fabinius theorem on page one. And this is probably the mathematically most deep uh, slide I've got on in the whole talk. So if, it, if you're not interested in reading it, you don't have to. And uh, maybe you can pull a seat for a minute and then we'll, we'll come back to stuff which is not quite like this. So what it actually says is. Let T be a primitive non-negative matrix. Now, this thing primitive, I'm going to talk about in a minute, but let's for a moment assume that we've got something called a primitive non-negative matrix. And the important thing about being non-negative is, um, well, it needs to be non-negative for these results to hold, but I'll point out that the way it was defined that um, the matrix A that corresponds to web links is non-negative. It's either got a one over N or a zero. So it's got zero entries, and it's got some positive entries, but it doesn't have negative entries. So it is a non-negative matrix. Then if we've got one of these things, then there's a positive real number R. So this is important. It's a real number. Remember, eigenvalues in general can be complex, but this one is real. There's a positive real number R that is an eigenvalue of the matrix T, which is called the Perrin Fabinius eigenvalue. What do we know about it? Well, the first thing is that it's simple. Now, I didn't really mention what it means for an eigenvalue to be simple, but if you've done first-year linear algebra, you'll know that it has to be a simple root of the characteristic equation, um, or that the eigenspace that corresponds to it is one-dimensional. There are a couple of things about that. But in any case, this, this special eigenvalue, which is positive and real, is simple. Both the right and left eigenspaces is associated with R are one-dimensional. So, in, a, in some sense, its geometric multiplicity is one. For any other eigenvalue lambda of t, which in this case can be complex, but if, but in any case, the absolute value of lambda is strictly less than r. So in some sense, that's why it's a dominant eigenvalue because it's bigger than all the other eigenvalues in modulus. Corresponding to the eigenvalue r, T has got left and right eigenvectors, W and V, whose components are all positive. So not only is R positive real, but so are the left and right eigenvectors that correspond to it. Um, they're positive, and by positive, that implies that they're real as well. So they, even though um, uh, I've mentioned that T is non-negative, so T itself can have zero entries, the left and right eigenvectors corresponding to R can't. They're completely positive, so they're not allowed to be zero. And the only eigenvectors whose components are all positive are those associated with the eigenvalue R. So there are no other left eigenvectors corresponding to any other eigenvalue who are positive. So if we go back to this, we want our ranking to be a positive number. So we want this vector R to be positive and, and C well, they haven't really said what C or 1 over C actually is, but they want it to be a positive number. It's just a scaling constant. So in some sense, and, and we know A is a non-negative matrix. So uh, the only way it can satisfy the sort of characteristics that, um, that the authors of 1 actually want is if this thing R is the dominant eigenvector of the web matrix A. So that's, that sort of follows from this. Now, there is one thing here which is really important, and that is the word primitive. And what does primitive mean? The actual definition of T being primitive means there must be some power of T such that T to the N is all positive. So T itself 
can have zero entries. But if you power it enough up enough sufficiently, then you need t to the power n to be completely positive. And once t to the n is positive, then t to the n plus r is positive for any other uh, non-negative number r. Because once you've got a, a positive matrix multiplied by a non-negative matrix, the product is, is positive. So what you really want for t to be primitive is to have a power n such t to the n is strictly positive. And that's an important property because if it's not primitive, some of these things, uh, some of these properties hold in a modified sense, but for the, for the real beauty of the parent Fabinius theorem to, to come out, you need t to be primitive, which means you need some power of t to be completely positive. So Page L, they wanted their page rank vector to be the parent Fabinius left eigenvector of the matrix A. And so they wanted to apply that theorem that I've just quoted. But there's a problem. The matrix A for the web graph is not primitive. You can show that it's not primitive. And there's a few reasons why it's not primitive. To, to explain that, I'm just going to di uh, make a bit of a diversion. Um, one thing about this web matrix A, because they made the out links, um, if there's n out links, um, then the entries are one over n from any given, well, if there's n out links from a web page u, then the, the, um, the entries are one over n u. It means that the sum across the rows of the matrix A all are one because there's n entries that are all equal to one over n. And that's good because it means that the matrix A has the property of being stochastic. A non-negative matrix is called stochastic if all its row sums are equal to one. It's called substochastic if all its row sums are less than or equal to one. They have to be non-negative as well, but the whole matrix is non-negative, so that's... Now, in fact, the way I defined A, it looked like it was stochastic, but that's not actually true. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But in any case, a necessary and sufficient condition for any substochastic matrix A to be primitive in other words, that there's a power that we can power it up that makes it completely positive, is that it be irreducible and aperiodic. They're two conditions which are, are quite natural for anyone who works with Markov chains. Irreducible really means that there is a path to get from any entry to any other entry. You don't have, it, have to be able to do it in one go, but if you've got a web page U and another web page V, there has to be a path of getting from U to V in some number of steps. And aperiodicity really just means, uh, it's a, got a technical uh, definition in terms of um, uh, highest, um, greatest common divisors of, of entries and things. It's a technical condition, which I don't really want to go into, but it's reasonably easy to look at a matrix and tell whether it's aperiodic. Um, aperiodicity, I don't think it's a problem with web pages. So we'll take the matrix A is naturally aperiodic. But there is a problem with reducibility. Um, and why is that? The web graph is not irreducible. There are pages that can be reached from other pages, for example, that have no outgoing links at all. And in fact, if you think about that, we haven't really defined what's going on in this matrix A if um, there are no outgoing links from a web page. Because I said there's a one over n u for all the, uh, the uh, links that correspond, all the uh, entries that correspond to a link. But if there are no links at all, that makes n u equal to zero and there's nothing to make non-zero anyway. So you might say, well, the corresponding row of such a matrix A should be all zeros. And if you did that, it would not be possible to get from such a page to any other page, right? So there is no irreducibility in the web. And so what that actually means in the notation that was defined in, in the, the paper one, is that there are web pages where you can get into. So U is some web page that's got some predecessors that point to it, but there's no, it doesn't itself point to any web pages. So F of U equals the empty set. And we really need to think about what we do here. Um, and one thing is pretty natural, and I'm pretty sure it's what, um, uh, what the authors of one did, is if 
there is such a entry which would naturally make the corresponding row of a the row of a corresponding to the web page u equal to zero we replace it with a constant row that sums to one in other words you put one over the total number of pages in the web in every entry and so what that does is turn the previous sub stochastic matrix a because the row sums corresponding to these pages u with no outgoing links was equal to zero and now it makes the row sums of those pages equal to one as well it makes the matrix a stochastic so it's a non-negative matrix with all its row sums equal to one and here's the uh, the example of of um, those what i called hanging web pages you've got some web pages point to u but f of u is equal to the empty set so this means that if you're in U, we can't get to any other web pages. So that means that the web graph is not irreducible. So what we did is we added in a link from U to every other web page. It's going to be a pretty small um, vote once you've divided U by the number of web page, uh, the divided the rank of U by the number of uh, pages in the web. But nevertheless, it is positive and it means we can solve the equation. So that's good. Maybe we've got over the problem of not being primitive. Well, in fact, we haven't, because just putting outgoing links from um, a hanging web page doesn't actually make a difference to the irreducibility, because the same thing can happen with pairs. And this is something that was recognized by um, the authors of one. Again, they didn't write it in a mathematical sense at all. Uh, they just, I guess, had the right intuition. So I'll just show you what it looks like. Imagine this is the rest of the web. Here's two pages, U1 and U2. They both have outgoing links. The outgoing link from U2 goes to U1. The outgoing link from U1 goes to U2. So they do have outgoing links and they do, in this case, they would have a, a, an entry equal to one in the U2, U1 entry. So in row U2 and column U1, there would be a one just for one outgoing link. And likewise, in the row U1, column U2 entry, there'd be a one. But if you think about it, if you're in either one of these pages, you can get to the other one, but you can't get anywhere else in the web. Okay, you're going backwards and forwards here. There's no way you can get anything else out here. So again, the definition of irreducibility is not satisfied. So just dealing with those entries with zero rows uh, doesn't solve the problem. And of course, yeah, there's more general versions of this. So this is with two pages, but you could have any arbitrary set with any arbitrary thing that's going on between them here as long as if you can't ever get back to some other set then we don't have irreducibility so this is what page it said there's a small problem with this simplified ranking function consider two web pages that point to each other but to no other page now suppose there's some web page which points to one of them that's exactly what we've got in the diagram i just showed you then during the iteration this loop will accumulate rank but never distribute any rank since there are no out edges it forms a sort of trap which we call a rank sink. To overcome this problem of rank sinks, we introduce a rank source. I characterize that as a really good intuitive physical understanding of what's happening by people who are not trained to think about it mathematically. Um, they didn't really understand what was going on in terms of things like irreducibility in the Perrin Frobenius theorem, but they sort of had a pretty good intuition. And in fact, um, so what did they actually do? They changed their definition of page rank. They said, let E of U be some vector of the web pages that corresponds to a source of rank. So what they basically said, if you're a web page U, um, you get your votes from all the other web pages, like we did before, but there's also some external source that just gives you rank. And the amount of rank the youth web page gets just from that is E of U. So the page rank is an assignment R to the web pages which satisfies this equation. And they wrote such that C is maximized and such that the total um, size of R is equal to one. This is the actually the one norm. They, they want to sum the entries and get one. Okay, that's what they did. It says in the um, 
if you write it in matrix form, it's actually R equals CRA plus E. E is a matrix that's got rows E of U. The youth row is, called, is E of U. And a popular choice is to make E a matrix all of rows who are constant sum to one. So E is essentially something like a matrix full of one over NWs, where NW is the total number of nodes in the whole web. So E is a, essentially a constant matrix. And in the paper, Page et al claimed they implemented it with an algorithm, which to be honest, I've tried to understand and I don't actually understand how it implements this, but that's what they say in their paper. What is actually thought, and of course, no one actually knows, well, I'm sure plenty of people do, the ones who worked in Google and were there, but it's not widely known outside that, um, what actually happens, but it's generally thought, the actual implementation of PageRank solves the equation of the form r equals d times r of a d is some weighting factor plus one minus d times e where e is this constant row summing to one and the factor d is conjectured to be 0.85 or was you know so it's generally thought that that was the actual implementation the first implementation of course google is way more sophisticated than that now but it was generally thought that's what actually happened and if you actually stipulate the ranking has to go to one, which they did um, back here, such as C is maximized and, and the, the one norm of R is equal to one, then you can rewrite that in this form. R equal, so this um, basically R times one is one. Um, you write E as a column one times the, um, your row vector E which is generally also a bunch of one over n. So you get a whole matrix and you really get R being um, satisfying this equation. And you think of this matrix here, DA plus one minus DE, as a transition matrix of a Markov chain. It's a stochastic matrix. And roughly what it says is with probability D, 0.85, you follow the outlink of, uh, from your web page, or with the probability one minus D, 0.15, you pick a random web page and go to it. So you can think of this as um, what you can think of it as a, a transition matrix of a Markov chain that might be followed by a random web surfer, surfer, which when it was on a page, it looks at all the hyperlinks and chooses one randomly. With, well, first with probability D, it decides to do that. With probability one minus D, it forgets about what the hyperlinks are from the page it's on and just jumps somewhere else in the web completely uniformly. You can do some stuff because it's stochastic. You know this matrix has got a parent of any eigenvalue equal to one, and that makes our the stationary distribution. I mean, the stationary distribution of a discrete time Markov chain is in fact this parent of any left eigenvector, and it's the Markov chain as I just explained that a random web surfer would follow. So that's great. That we sort of understand what's going on now and what the page rank is. It's really um, some some measure of ranking um, where you would be if you were just a, a web surfer that was following hyperlinks around the web with this extra little modification to deal with the irreducibility problems of jumping out and going to anywhere in a random fashion. And in fact, there's something better about this. It's a really got a really nice property, which is two guys, Haveli Walla and Kamvar in 2003, it's important to look at the second highest eigenvalue because the second highest eigenvalue actually governs how quickly the repeated iteration algorithm converges to the highest, uh, to the um, parent Fabinius eigenvector. If the second highest eigenvalue is bounded away from one by some distance, this algorithm converges quickly. If it's close to one, it converges more slowly. So in fact, you can show that the second highest eigenvalue of this matrix is bounded above by D. So you can show that the second highest eigenvalue of this matrix is bounded above by 0.85, which means if you just iterate the thing, um, the convergence of this to the, to the actual page, this simple iterative algorithm to the page rank R is reasonably quick. And I mentioned that's important because we're working out eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a matrix but you, for the web matrix, it's completely impossible to do what you're taught to do in linear algebra, 
and solve the characteristic equation to get the eigenvalues and then solve an equation to get the eigenvector. That doesn't work. And the, what you need to do is use this iterative algorithm of just, just repeatedly multiplying this matrix, starting out with some vector R, multiplying it by the matrix repeatedly, and that calculation will converge to, to the page rank uh, vector. And you want that convergence to happen quickly. And the speed of that convergence is governed, governed by the magnitude of the second highest eigenvalue. Um, and as this result says that, that the, as well as providing a way of getting over the irreducibility problem, making, choosing a good D makes this algorithm converge quickly. Okay, so that's all I want to say about the paper one. I just want to finish off by a couple of bits of experience, which goes back to me at my mention that I thought, okay, well, why don't we use this for ranking citations? So, as I said, when I first did a page rank, I thought it'd be interesting to experiment using it to rank papers on the basis of academic citations. And I didn't know at the time that citation analysis was part of the thing that motivated Page et al. in the first place. Now, I might, before I go on, I want to say I'm well known for not for arguing against ranking papers based on citations anyway. Um, a lot of people do it, and there's things called H indices and impact factors of journals and stuff, which I don't like. But if you're going to do it, there's some characteristics of page rank that make it better than some crude analysis, if you have to do it. So, back in 2006, we had some, I had some vacation students. Um, Peshwan Go, Joshua Pask, and Suganya Pathan. Um, and the vacation project these guys worked on was experimenting with using PageRank to rank academic papers. And I've got hold of three different data sets of, um, of citations of papers of each other. Um, Pitt Patterson, who was in, in the School of Behavioral Science, I think it was then, um, had access to this as, as an, an example of social network data. Sorry, where am I? Um, sorry, got myself out of order. Um, and what we did is calculated a ranking basically using the formula here, which is essentially what I've been talking about up for now. So basically WIJ is one over NI if paper I searches paper J and NI is the total number of citations that paper I has. It's slightly different because um, I didn't make this one over, um, I, I didn't normal, I normalized it differently. So the total rank is M wider than one, M being the total number of papers, but that's all that the difference is. And how do we do this? And this, um, so the thing about papers is they're usually written in the chronological order. You know, you can say that you cite a previous paper. It's not quite the same with web pages because sometimes web pages get updated and hyperlinks get added, but that's harder to do with papers. So what you can actually do if your data is presented in a chronological order is solve that equation from the most recent to the earliest. So the most recent, this term is zero because the most recent paper can't be cited by any other paper. So you, you assign that one and then you go to the second most recent, et cetera, and you can work backwards. So the latest paper in the data gets given a ranking of one minus d equals 0.15 and you work backwards. And we implemented that. But of course, this isn't a very good practical algorithm because as soon as you add a new paper to the data set, as soon as a new paper comes along and starts citing things, you've got to start all over again. Because now the one we started with before, the most recent is not the most recent. It might've been cited by the most recent paper and its ranking should update. So this can be done, but it's not a very good way of doing it. Or you could just do an iterative thing. Um, you assign each paper some ranking. It could be one over D, one, uh, one minus D. It could be anything else you really want. And then just cycle through the papers from one to M continuously applying that formula, updating things. And we did this and it eventually converged as you, you can show that it will. Um, and, the, and the advantage of this is if a new paper comes along, you just insert them into the calculation. Um, you know, you, it gets, um, first it's not going to be, um, it, it might um, reference some of the other papers, cite the other papers. So when they look at the other papers, they suddenly start counting an extra citation they've got and putting it in their own ranking. And this thing will converge over time. Or in fact, if papers keep getting added 
fast in the algorithm, it, it will sort of track um, over time something which is reasonably, uh, you can reasonably think of is, is the time dependent page rank. The other way you can do it is just completely random. Just randomly decide you're going to update um, a ranking of a paper. So that paper decides, okay, it's time for me to update. It looks at all the other papers that cite it and, and then updates its own ranking. So you might get the uh, ranking one paper updated multiple times before that of another, but it doesn't matter, it still converges. Um, and the neat thing about this, even though it might converge quite slowly, is that you can do it in a distributed manner. You don't need any coordination. So if a page you joins the web, sends a message to each node in, um, that it, it cites. So let's say node V is one of them. Um, node V then knows that you is citing it. So it adds you to its uh, um, uh, set of backward upstream pages. And it's updates its own page rank by the extra value it gets by the knowledge that, that it's been cited by you. And at random points, which you can make, say the points of a Poisson process, you just make the nodes update their page rank um, by polling all their backward nodes and asking whether their um, page ranks have been updated. And if they have, that's fine. This does converge. Um, don't know if it's what Google does, but you can do it. And Tim, that's the end of my talk. I'm happy to answer any questions. Hey, thanks very much, Peter. Um, so you've answered a lot during the course of the talk, but there, there is another new one. Um, so how sensitive to other values of D, for example? Well, I think if D is 0.9, then all these iterative algorithms just converge more slowly. Um, so it makes the second highest eigenvalue equal to 0.9. So roughly speaking, it, the, the, the gap uh, converges like the difference between the highest eigenvalue, which is one, and the other. Um, so I think it's one over that or something, but it governs the convergence rate and the convergence rate will be more, will be slower. Um, so if, you, if anybody has any more questions, feel free to put them in the, in the Q&A, but I actually have one. So, um, I mean, when I teach this, I teach it as a Markov chain. And when you were talking about the R vector being normalized L1 norm to one, it seems like they're sort of thinking about probabilities, but there was no mention of Markov chains in any of the quotes that you put up from their paper. Do, do you think they knew that they were really talking about Markov chains or is it all just implicit? I don't think they did. I mean, I can only guess because I can only go by what they wrote. But you're right, they didn't mention it. They weren't multiplying on the left, which anyone who works in Markov chains would. Um, oh, some people can transpose the matrix, but most applied probabilists don't do that. Um, and, you know, um, they didn't necessarily, it was, they, they eventually normalized R to one. Uh, initially, they say some C, which we use to maximize in the overall. So I don't think they did. I mean, as I say, I, I, my general, they were computer scientists. I think they had great intuition. I'd love to know whether they did a graduate course at Stanford in you know, Markov chains or applied probability, because if they did, I think they would have written things differently. Yeah. Um, okay, there's a couple more questions in the, in the Q and A. So, um, evidently, you can pay Google to upgrade your page rank. How is this done? Uh, look, I don't know, Martin. I'm sorry. This is yeah. I mean, as I said, Google's moved on a lot. I wasn't aware you could actually do that. I do know there is a literature out there of people thinking up strategies by you know putting other pages and putting in your own links and stuff to actually increase your page rank. Um, people do think about those questions and a lot of people reckon they've got good solutions and a lot of companies will charge you for that. Um, I didn't know when you could go directly to Google, but nothing would surprise me in the, in, um, the world of entrepreneurial mathematics. But uh, yeah, I don't know is the answer. Uh, so the next one's getting back to convergence. So is there a reason why larger D results in slow? It's, it's about the spectral gap. Um, you know, the spectral gap, uh, any dynamical system, um, when you study them, the, the rate of convergence has to do with the spectral gap between the largest eigenvalue, which in this case is one and the second largest. 
if you there, there's a way you, there is a mathematical reason but I, I don't think I really want to go into details at the moment um, so next question do you know if the initial matrix was defined for all web pages or just web pages that satisfied the current search conditions in other words do you believe the matrix was recreated for each unique search again I'll just preface it by saying I don't know because I don't work for Google, but I don't think they could have done the calculation quick enough every time someone did a search. I think they do have to pre-calculate these things. Now, whether it's pre-calculated for the whole lot, I don't know. But I believe at the moment they have crawlers going around updating stuff all the time. Um, so, you know, and then when you do a search, you've got the ranking there ready to be used. Yep. Um, question from David Warren. What was the outcome of PageRank of papers versus other metrics used? Well, one thing that I really like about PageRank when you do this, and I would say is the number one thing, is it actually normalizes for the citation culture. So if you have, say, a set of papers that all cite a lot of other papers, and you have another set of papers which you might call, say, mathematical science papers that don't cite much, because we certainly don't in in a research culture of mathematical sciences compared to say biosciences or engineering. The, to the, the total number of page rank of M papers and the one I did uh, with the normalization we did will always be M, right? So each, um, the, and, and that's good. So, and roughly the intuition is that if you've got a high citing discipline, then um, you've got a ranking, which you can only, um, you, you cite a lot of other papers, which makes your one over N small so you don't get to contribute much to another paper's ranking whereas if you've got a low citing discipline um, you're not passing your vote on to many other papers but when you do it's a relatively large vote so really um, a high citing discipline a paper typically pass on a lot of small votes to a lot of other papers and then a low citing discipline um, you pass on one or two big votes to a couple of papers and it turns out that the totals sum of the citations um, of the rankings of papers in both cultures is the same. So in some sense, it gives a comparison of papers in a high citing discipline and a low citing discipline, which just counting citations doesn't do. So I think that's the best, uh, the best property of the page rank algorithm compared to other citation um, performance measure algorithms. That's interesting. Um, mm. So you can wearing as a follow up question. I think when he was asking about D before, he's talking about the impact it has on the final rankings rather than. Conversion. I don't believe that's a good question, you gang. Um, if D is not too big, then it's really D is actually, if you like, introducing noise into the signal. If you think about it, having this random jump to another thing, and the signal is still discoverable for quite. Uh, I think D can go quite a lot less than 0.85, and you can still recover the actual. Um, the actual ranking. So I don't think that final R scores are very sensitive to that. So just a comment from Mark, uh, maybe intuition was formed by trying stuff and seeing it didn't work. Well, I think that's right. And look, early in my career, I did a lot of work with engineers and computer scientists. And I thought, if you want a good career in maths, you can do a, a lot worse than look at what engineers and computer scientists do and then interpret it and, and actually explain what it should be in mathematical terms. Because typically people who work with systems do have a really good intuition about the way they work, even if sometimes they're not able to express it all that well. Uh, another question, if they weren't thinking about stochastic matrices, what would they have meant by dominant eigenvector? Um, Nora, uh, any non-negative matrix has a dominant eigenvector. That The parent Frobenius theorem still holds. Um, there's a result that says that the dominant eigenvalue uh, lies between the maximum row sum and the minimum row sum, and it can only be equal to them if everything's equal. So that's a really neat way of showing that the dominant eigenvalue of a stochastic matrix has to be equal to one because the maximum row sum is one, the minimum row sum is one, and therefore the dominant eigenvalue has to be one. But a general non-negative matrix um, uh, has still has a dominant eigenvalue and a dominant eigenvector. And in fact, that result can be extended to things um, which are generally have different answers, essentially non-negative, or the economists call them M matrices. It can work even if you subtract the diagonal matrix off them. Um, there's still a dominant eigenvector. Whether it extends to more general matrices than that, 
I'm not aware of classes of matrix. There start to be problems. So um, certainly non-negative matrices, there's no problem. And matrices that subtract diagonal, diagonal matrices is, is also no problem. But um, you, get a, you probably have to look at specific cases after that. Um, so the next question is a practical one. Just thinking about the number of web pages on the internet, um, we'd have an absolutely massive matrix. What tricks can you do to scale the matrix, et cetera, so the matrix multiplication is feasible? Well, that's really what I was doing with that last bit, trying to do with these random update um, things. You just pick a row of a matrix and decide to update that one. Um, and if you do that fast enough, um, you can approximate matrix um, iterations and matrix multiplications. I don't know what Google do, but I think it must be something like that. So I think we've already answered the next one from Alison. So maybe I'll, mm. I'll skip that mm. one. Um, and David's question, David Balding, the PageRank algorithm works well to identify the web page we're looking for. Using the analogy with citation scores, what does a high rank tell us about papers that score well? They are the papers that most people want to read that would make citation rank seem more useful than I previously thought? Yeah, uh, Dave, that's a good question that has occurred to me. Like I've not ever been a real fan of citations, but if there was a citation rank, I mean, in some sense, if you think, go back to the, um, to the motivation of the, of the Google people, they said, one, we've got to have the right query word. So it's got to be in the set of things you're looking for. But then we have a look at that set and we choose the ones with the highest rank. Now we might say that's silly, um, but it's quite clear that out in the competitive marketplace, by putting that in, Google suddenly became everyone's search engine because it did find pages that people wanted better than other search engines that didn't have the rank. So you could argue that the marketplace made its decision on that. And I guess your proposal, David, is that maybe the marketplace might make the same decision about looking for, for papers as well. And yeah, I think you have to concede that might be true. I don't actually know. Um, Okay, I think we've got time for one final question. Um, so in your citation example, there's a prior step of defining the set you're considering. Isn't this an issue? You exclude some papers a priori. Uh, I'm not sure what Ian means. Do you mean, Ian, that we're talking about saying which pages are in the set of pa pages we're looking at? Um, I believe Google tries to make that as much as it can every page on the web. Um, I don't quite know how they implement that. I don't think that they are really trying to restrict the set of pages. Um, of course, there might be a practical problem in including every page. Um, in the papers, um, yeah, I just dealt with whatever data set I could get my hold on. If we get a hold of, if it would be really interesting to do this, say with you know, well, I'll, I'll risk. I don't think we should be paying a real lot of attention to citations, so there is a risk to, you know, overvaluing them. But if it, it would be an interesting exercise to do this with some big data set of, of citations. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we should probably wrap up. So let me thank you again one more time, Peter, for a very, very nice talk. Um, and thank you all for joining us for this very special final ASIMS public lecture. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you enjoyed any of the other ASIMS public lectures that you may have seen. And uh, all the best.